And finally, we are there. We are at the finish line of chapter two, and we can finally get on with the main quest. But this video is going to be covering the Goliaths of Wormdoom Crag. Wormdoom Crag, located a measly 40 miles away from civilization, these people are out there in the boonies, and they probably don't interact with the civilizations too much. These Goliaths, of course, have a running feud with the Goliaths of Sky Tower Shelter, and in a moment here, we're going to get into how you can have your players peacefully resolve the tensions between the two Goliath tribes, and so they can unite and be happy and potentially be used later on. But why would your players show up to Warm Doom Crag? It's out in the middle of frickin' nowhere. You have to trek 40 miles out in the wilderness? That sucks. So why are the players going there? Let's go ahead and take a look at what we have. For our tall tale of Ten Town, we have this simple little thing that is shared with the other Goliaths. We don't see the Goliaths much around here, but there are two feuding clans in the spine of the world. I bet if someone from Ten Towns were to help them put aside their differences, all Goliaths would benefit. I'd sure like to see some Goliaths someday. Once again, I, I stated this in the previous episode, but d d why? Why? Throw that out there. Just go ahead and say something along the lines of, Man, we could totally use the Goliath's help in combating whatever threats coming after us. All these Charlin Berserkers, the Knolls, the the Verbigs. You can just come up with something. Because, you know, just having some random person say, I'd sure like to meet a Goliath someday. That's lame. And especially if one of your players is a Goliath, then this doesn't make any sense at all. For our quest to get us to Wormdoom Crag, we have Dragon Bone Stew. Danica Graysteel... I, why did they select this name? This is a porn star name. Why would they ever give this to a named character in a family-friendly D&D game? Whatever. Danica Graysteel, a scholar, is going to go ahead and say, Hey, I know there's a location where there's bones. Go ahead and get me some of those dragon bones, and I can make you potions of cold resistance. You don't have to say much to get your players to get potions of cold resistance in this campaign. If you tell them, oh, hey, go there, you'll get potions of cold resistance, they're going to go in a heartbeat. So this quest is awesome because it takes us out to the middle of nowhere. It gets us involved with the Goliaths. But what's also really fun to note is she doesn't know that if you use dragon bones to make potions of cold resistance, then these potions of cold resistance will give you madness. Anybody who drinks a potion of this cold resistance will gain the greed and paranoia of a dragon. And this can only be cured by greater restoration or similar magic. So that's really cool. You brew these potions of cold resistance. You're feeling like so cool. And then you're about to go into combat with something that does cold damage. You drink it. You do the combat just fine. And then you look around at the loot. And then you're like, hmm. Our loot, I think that's more like my loot. I, I think that's really cool. But those are just some hooks to get us to Wormdoom Crag. What about other hooks? Well, of course, we could have a Goliath in the party who is actually from Wormdoom Crag or they're from Sky Tower Shelter and wants to check up on things. That's always a possibility. One idea I like is the idea of an excavation team heading out to the Ragged Glacier to check out on something. They've heard rumors that there is something going on near the Ragged Glacier in the spine of the world and you can place that right around here-ish. And you can go ahead and say, oh yeah, this is going to be a big expedition. You can say that there's going to be 30 people, there's going to be a whole bunch of pack mules, and they're going to need some guards. And your players can go ahead and be guards for a pretty handsome reward. And once they make their way through these mountains, then once they get right to that little pass there, the Goliaths are going to go ahead and stop them and say, hey, you know, what are you doing this far out here? I like that approach, especially because if your players don't already know about the Goliaths around here, then that's a great way to introduce the players to the Goliaths, both in the Warm Doom Crag and Sky Tower Shelter. And if they meet this group of Goliaths first, they might be biased against the other group of Goliaths later. And lastly, for a possible hook here, we have the possibility that your players could be searching for a lost Aarakocra. Semi-recently, an Aarakocra fell and was taken in by the Goliaths of Wormdoom Crag, and now this Aarakocra is in their care. You could have an Aarakocra in one of the ten towns go ahead and put out wanted posters for this missing Aarakocra, and once your players go to investigate, they say, oh, you know, my, my kin, my friend, my possible, you know, family, whatever the case may be, this Aarakocra is searching for their missing companion, Scry Cream. 
So you can have this Eric Coker friend go ahead and say, Scrag Cree was flying up in the mountains somewhere. It'd be nice if you could just go ahead and search around the general area. And you could go ahead and like paint a circle on where they believe them to be. And then your players go out and once again they get met with the Goliaths. So whichever hook you choose, your players eventually arrive at Wormdoom Crag and this is what they will see. And here we are, Wormdoom Crag. We get some information once again on Into the Mountains. It basically states that your players are going to be traveling around here and that they'll be exploring around in mountains. And mind you, if you run mountain travel purely as ridden, it's going to take absolutely ages for them to arrive here. For the Wormdoom Crag overview, we get some good information about how these Goliaths are not like the other Goliaths. They, in fact, are super friendly and are willing to have people join in and they are willing to share food and shelter for the low, low cost of sharing stories about what's new in Icewind Dale. And also, we get some really cool information on Goat Ball. What is Goat Ball, you may ask? Well, it's essentially like Dodgeball, except you're tackling people. This is Goat Ball. Basically, you have a whole bunch of people standing on random stones plot all over the place. There is a ball made out of goats, and you're going ahead and chucking at people and forcing them to fall off. Pretty simple game, and I, I'm sure it's a ton of fun. The rules for playing Goat Ball are pretty simple. All you have to do is have everyone that is playing roll an acrobatics or an athletics check, and then you go ahead and take a look at the results, and by the end of it, and by the end of it, the team with the highest total wins. In the event of a tie, the game goes into overtime and all players re-roll. Pretty simple stuff, and I'm sure you can have a lot of fun roleplay encounters with that, and we'll be getting into that in area two here. In Area 1, the approach, your players, as they make their way up to Wormdoom Crag, are going to spot the skeletal figure of a dragon that has basically been laid here for quite some time. As your players look at the skeletal remains of this dragon, they're actually going to see four little Chewingas that are dancing around and being happy. And each of these little Chewingas has something that they're fixated on. It states here that if your players indulge the Chewingas' fascination for three days straight, then lo and behold, they will be given a supernatural gift, which is a pretty cool thing to do. If your players are sticking around here for some time and they meet the criteria for any one of these Chewinga, they're going to be in for an awesome reward. Chewinga number one is fascinated with small characters and wants to ride around on them. Chewinga number two is fascinated with beards and likes to comb them with a pine cone. Chewinga number three is fascinated by whistling and its own reflection. And Chewinga number four is really gross. It is fascinated by characters who chew with their mouths open and tries to look down their mouths while they eat. So it's basically a toddler. So your players that came here to get the dragon's bones, they might just immediately start, you know, hacking away at this thing and trying to get the bones. Or if they are just, you know, got those looters and those hoarders that like getting, you know, the little items, they're going to go ahead and start hacking away at these bones. But the thing is, is that these bones are here for a reason and they're here to tell a story, and the Goliaths aren't going to like it if you just show up and start stealing their swag. In Area 2, we have the Goat Ball Court, and this is where you would want to show off that art so you can show off what this would actually look like. Your players are hopping around from stone to stone and trying to yeet this ball at whoever they can in order to win. If your players actually make friendly with the Goliaths, they'll actually be invited to play, which is really dope. They don't have to participate, though. If you have players that are not physically inclined, they can go ahead and sit on the sidelines. But anybody who wishes to participate can totally play. In Area 3, we have the Weaponsmith. The Weaponsmith stationed here, her name is Wayani High Hunter Thunlaka Laga. Apparently, she's a pretty good smith. She, in fact, actually emulates the Dwarven Smiths that she learned her craft from. And she is just constantly at work and is pretty proficient at her job. She has some javelins and some great axes at the ready, but these are all non-magical, of course. Basically, she's only here if your players sneak up here and take a peek in and they see her, and they can go ahead and just talk to her, and she can go ahead and introduce them to the rest of the tribe. In Area 4, we have the Crawl, and it's here where there's actually a really cool ritual that Goliath's Coming of Youth undertake. There's an elderly Goliath named Demolek Nightwalker Thunlakalaga, and he is the one that basically conducts these trials. These trials are a coming of age event where people will go ahead and crawl into one side of the tunnel with a childhood belonging, crawl all the way through the tunnel, and come out the other side. The only thing is though, is when they crawl through this tunnel, they will receive visions that are gonna go ahead and haunt them. 
These visions include facing their fears, experiencing what it means to truly be alone, and recognizing their own weaknesses. The thing about this trial is, it's not as easy as just crawling forward easy peasy. No, actually a lot of people actually fail this thing, because it is admittedly hard. If your players are told about this trial, because as soon as they walk in they might be able to see that some people are conducting this trial, your players might say, hey, we're strong, we want to do this. The Goliaths are going to say, hey, this is not for the faint of heart, but if you complete this, then you are truly a Thun Laka Laga member. Should your players go through this trial, then at the midway point of this intersection, they must succeed on a DC 15 Constitution saving throw and a DC 15 Charisma saving throw. If they fail on one of these rolls, then they simply turn around and go back. They cannot go forward. However, if they fail both of these rolls, then their visions of terror overwhelm them and they fall unconscious for 4d6 hours. Awesome stuff. However, if people succeed on both of these saving throws, then they make it out the other side and truly become a Thun Laka Laga. Admittedly, a DC 15 Charisma saving throw and Con saving throw is going to be pretty freaking hard for most people, honestly. Because one, Charisma is a pretty big dumb stat. Not too many people are proficient in Charisma saving throws. Not too many people are in proficient in Constitution saving throws. So usually you're going to have someone that's going to be pretty decent at one, but not the other. And it's unlikely for someone to be good at both. Unless you've got that sneaky paladin, especially if that paladin's level 7 and they're giving themselves that extra buff. Mm, so good. In area 5, we have the main hall. And funnily enough, even though it is a main hall, this is primarily a sleeping quarters. <laughs> this is where just a lot of people go ahead and just hang out. And, you know, it seems like a pretty casual place. These Goliaths are a friendly socialite bunch. So they're constantly interacting with each other and they're more than willing to interact with anybody that comes by. It is here where your players are going to first meet Ogolai, and if they haven't already interacted with these Sky Tower individuals, then they're not going to know who this person is. But if they've already been to Sky Tower Shelter, then they're going to know that they need to get Ogolai's cloak. If your players sit down and they're trying to negotiate the peace between the two Goliaths, Ogolai is going to go ahead and tell her side of the story. Many summers ago, the children of Wormdoom challenged the children of Sky Tower to a game of goat ball. During the game, the ball tumbled near one of the griffins of Sky Tower. When one of our children tried to fetch the ball, the griffin went berserk and grievously wounded her. When the game was called off. Hungry for more of the child's flesh, the griffin hunted Wormdoom for days. Our hunters were forced to kill it and protect the child. The two clans have been opposed ever since. The thing that she leaves out about this story is that she is in fact the one that was wounded by the griffin. And she actually has a facial scar to this day. If your players come here and say, hey, we're willing to negotiate the peace, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, you know, your players are going to be able to find out that Ogolai says, hey, you know, I'm not having the meeting there, screw that. And she's, of course, afraid of griffins to this day. Why wouldn't you be if a giant beast practically mauled you when you were a kid? But she's going to go ahead and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to have to have it not at Sky Tower Shelter, which obviously contradicts what the other person says and says that he wants it at Sky Tower Shelter. So more than likely, your players are going to have to negotiate that this encounter is going to happen on neutral ground. If your players actually spend enough time with Ogolai, she will go ahead and say that one of her Goliaths is missing. His name is Kapanuk. Kapanuk isn't going to be found anywhere though, because sadly, that guy is at Zardrok's Fortress, which is found in Chapter 3. And we'll be getting into Chapter 3, and that's going to be a... Oh my lord, that's going to be so much content there. The treasure found here is, of course, Ogolai's cloak, which is actually a cloak of protection. This thing looks cool, and it actually is cool. It, it presumably helps her out quite a lot. And lastly, here we have a well, and this well is actually pretty cool. It's a clean water well, and a fire bucket is lowered down on a rope to keep the water in the well from freezing. You know, that makes sense, because obviously water would be pretty hard to come by, especially if you lived in the middle of a mountain. So we don't get any more information about how Ogolai is going to respond in this section. All of the information regarding how the two Goliath tribes are going to interact is in the Sky Tower Shelter section, and I will be covering that after this. In Area 6, we have the Private Caves, and it's here where your players will be able to find an Aarakocra named Siki Kree. Siki Kree crashed into the mountains a little while back, and a Goliath named Aruk Thundercaller is mending to her wounds. But there's only so much physical amenities can actually do. This air cochra needs magical healing. Only 10 points of magical healing, mind you. That isn't too much, especially if you have some people like clerics or paladins or druids or whatever else in the party. That shouldn't be an issue. 
Once 10 points of magical healing are placed upon Siki Kree, Siki Kree will be able to fly again and profusely thank the party and the Goliaths for everything that they've done. And it's at this point, Ogoli will agree to meet with these Sky Tower Goliaths. Much like their compatriot Goliaths, these Goliaths do seemingly collect a whole bunch of gold, presumably just from out in the wilderness or whatever, but they don't actually use it. You know, they're not a trading system, right? They only use whatever they have on them. So they hand out gold whenever any Goliath is going to head to the Ten Towns, but other than that, they got a pretty decently sized horde here, and what's also cool is they do in fact have an elemental gem here, but they don't know that it's an elemental gem. So once again, if you've got players that love getting their fingers dirty and picking up things that they shouldn't, then they're probably going to be in for a great time here. And lastly, in Area 7, we have the Feasting Cave. It is here where, of course, the Goliaths feast. And your players, if they walk in here and they're on friendly terms with all of the Goliaths, then they will be able to go ahead and join in on some arm wrestling. This is just pure athletics v. athletics, and of course all of the martially inclined people are probably going to hop in on that and try and prove their worth. So how the arm wrestling mechanic works is you roll and you have to beat them twice in a row. Because if you roll once, you're at the halfway point, and then you fail, and then you're set back to, you know, whatever, neutral. So now that I've covered the two locations here, let's go ahead and discuss how your players are actually going to end the Goliath feud. As written, the only way your players are going to be able to end this feud is by doing the minor tasks that have been provided by both of the tribe leaders. Arn will only negotiate if he is given the Cloak of Protection and his mother is stripped of her blindness, and Ogolai will only come to the meeting if the Aarakocra is healed. Once your players do this, then they can go ahead and negotiate and see where this is going to go. It becomes pretty obvious that if your players talk to each of these tribe leaders that the only way this negotiation is going to take place is on neutral ground. However, once you've negotiated this talk, they each still want to bring essentially a warband with them. It is going to require several persuasion checks to go ahead and say, hey, hey, you know, tone those numbers down here. We don't want a full-blown battle. So purely as written, what this is saying is your players are going to spend a tremendous amount of time marching back and forth between these two locations, and it's going to be a nightmare because that is an absolute ton of time wasted. Your players are just going to be marching back and forth nonstop because they go and do this little fetch quest, go and do this little fetch quest. That they might have to go back, and depending on which one they go to first, they might have to do even more travel. So if you don't want your players to have to go through the absolutely excruciating minutia of having to go back and forth nonstop, one thing, one very simple thing you could just go ahead and introduce to this game is the fact that maybe these two Goliath tribes long, long ago had a sending stone where they could talk to each other and they'd be able to communicate when they were friends and had a whole bunch of merry talks oh so long ago. But now that they're at war, these things are collecting dust in the back of whatever their respective shelves are. If you introduce the Sending Stone, then you can go ahead and just only have to show up to each location one time, and that's it. Because you can go ahead and, and show up to one place, and then you, of course, learn all this information. You talk to the other tribe leader. The tribe leader says, hey, I'm not going to do a peace negotiation until I get this. And then your players go ahead and go over there, do that. And then they go ahead and have the peace talks over the communications and say hey we're going to show up to a location let's hash this out and then they go ahead and meet out in the open because talking on the phone's you know not personal at all you wouldn't you wouldn't negotiate a peace treaty over the phone you would go ahead and do it in person so after a tremendous amount of work your players finally get arn and ola guy together out in the open essentially It'd probably just be out in the middle of the tundra and it's there where your players can finally see the peace negotiations take place. However, as it states here, if your players don't intervene at all, then they're both just going to go ahead and walk away. So it says here that your players should go ahead and intervene somehow. They should bring up some of the important information about what's going on in the world and how your players can be the ones to help bring these two tribes together. So if you have players that are a little bit more timid and don't want to get themselves involved in these negotiations, one thing you could have is you could have one of the Goliath bodyguards go ahead and kind of whisper them and say, hey, like, it's not looking too good. Maybe you guys can go ahead and step on in and kind of help us out here. And hopefully that'll prompt your players to go ahead and say, hey, you know, you guys need to come together because da da da. So three possible solutions are listed here. The first one being the characters urge the chieftain to unite as one and to overcome a common threat. Oreal the Frost Maiden, Abiturius. 
Zardok, the Duragar, and many more. Your players could go ahead and say, hey, you know, you fractured, you guys are a little bit on the weaker side, but together as one, you guys are unstoppable. And hopefully that'll make them understand, oh, hey, you know, we should unite as one and, and we will be unbeatable. The second possible solution listed here is if any of the tribe leaders are convinced that if they accept peace first, that means they are the bigger person and thus they are way more, you know, better that will go ahead and show their moral strength and say, hey, you know, we are, we are better than this. Let's go ahead and hash this out. And the third possible solution listed here is just have them talking. Don't let them walk away. Just have them constantly talking. And this is going to be them just talking for days. This is going to be them out in the middle of the open saying, oh, you know, but back in this year, you guys did da-da-da. Oh, but, you know, that was BS, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they'll be yelling at each other, and then there'll be times where they just sit there in silence. But eventually, something's going to happen. Eventually, after all this argument, they are going to go ahead and console with each other. They're going to say, hey, you know, here's, I brought some food and tea for you. Oh, hey, thank you. Let's go ahead and, you know, you know, let's not fight anymore. Let's go ahead and be friends. There is, of course, many more solutions on how your players can go ahead and try and convince these two chieftains to work together. But of course, you know, leave that up to whatever it is. I know for a fact that any player that shows up is going to have their own interpretation and have their own idea on how to get these peace talks going. So hopefully with all that, your players do the stoic thing and get these two peoples to become one and are merry and happy and sunshine galore. Except for the big thing about they are coming together, yes, but... One thing you should totally consider is if your players actually get these Goliaths to go ahead and work together, then they probably are going to be useful in the future against some type of force. Whether that be the dragon, the Duragar, the, the Chartalin dragon, whatever major threat is imposing itself upon Ten Towns, the Goliaths should become in as a backup. And you should totally go ahead and show off the unity between these two different Goliath tribes. I like these two Goliath locations. They are not by any means dungeon dells at all. They're very shallow, very, you know, meager little maps here. But they're not meant to be combat encounters. Because one, mind you, these guys are pretty freaking strong. If your players actually go to combat with these Goliaths, they're probably going to get beat up a decent amount depending on what level they are. Goliaths hit hard, they got a big health pool, and there's a decent amount of them. So hopefully these things don't devolve into combat. But if they do, then go ahead and punish your players need be, or let them get away with whatever they desire. These two locations clearly show how much role-playing potential is possible even in a frozen wasteland. Woo! And just like that, we are done with chapter two. Oh my goodness, there is just so much going on in this chapter. And not only that, but the fact that chapters one and two are front-loaded with a bejesus ton of content. But that's good because that makes this game very replayable for you as a DM and possibly replayable for your players because, because they're more than likely not going to go to every single location in Chapter 2. Honestly, if you go to every single location, that'd probably be just a huge waste of time, honestly. Your players are more than likely going to go ahead and go to some places and then you're going to go ahead and thrust the main quest upon them. You're going to start throwing out Chapters 3, 4, 5, and so on. I like Chapter 2. Chapter 2 takes us all across this frozen tundra. It gets us to a lot of exciting locations. It lets us meet a whole bunch of new NPCs. Even though a lot of these things start out in the towns, of course, you know, the roleplay implications of so many of these places are felt even back home when they are out in the middle of nowhere. My players had an absolute blast going all around this frozen tundra, going to all these exciting places, meeting a lot of crazy people, and doing a lot of crazy things. Of course, my favorite being they went all the way to the It Ascendant. They said, hey, we're going to go ahead and get you a Psy Crystal, and they never went back because they didn't really care. And lo and behold, those Mind Flayers are looking at Dugan's Hole like a snack right now. Mm-mm-mm. But just like that, we are finally done with chapter two i'll be making a video on just recapping chapter two and my highs and my lows about it and how you can incorporate a lot of things but we can finally get on with the actual main quest of this game or at least you know the b plot of this quest the duragar side i consider the a plot being the whole frost maiden thing because that seems a little bit more you know open i guess <laughs> but that is going to do it for me 
go ahead and tell me your experiences with chapter two and i also really want to know your experiences with the goliaths because i think the goliaths can shape up a lot of different ways your players could accidentally cause some friction between them your players could try and play the goliaths against each other and try and get something out of it maybe they know for a fact that there's these veritable treasure hordes and they know that the only way to get to these treasure hordes is if the goliaths die maybe you don't play up the two goliath tribes as they are Maybe you make one clearly good and you make one clearly evil. Or maybe you make them both very ambiguous and your players are going to have to go ahead and play sides in this weird war. There is a lot of crazy things you can do with those Goliaths and how they can go ahead and impact the future. And mind you, my first video on the chapter 3 slash chapter 4 is going to involve them. The reason why I say that there's going to be a video on chapter 3 slash 4 is because... My god, is there is so much uproar on that whole, you know, dragon going around destroying the Ten Towns thing. A lot of people are, you know, up and up about it. But I will go ahead and give you lots of solutions on how you can possibly play that out. So go ahead and tell me all about the stuff because I want to hear it. I like hearing this stuff. And go ahead and subscribe because only 30% of my viewers are subscribed. I, I'm in tears right now. I can feel it. It's so sad. But that is going to do it for me. Thank you all for watching and have a good time.